Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News with me, Labo Daniel. Okay, so guys, um, I mean, I can't have three people in the health industry. I, I mean, I know you're a lawyer, but <laughs> I mean, you're still in the health industry, two doctors and Bukola, without talking about the lead story in Nigeria. Like the lead story was literally on the covers of all of the um, newspapers today. Uh, Monkeypox. Okay. Monkeypox is now in Lagos. You know, typically it's almost like Lagos is Nigeria. Okay. I mean, when it was in the other states, there was not so much noise about it. Okay. But now it's in Lagos. Everyone's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it is real. Yes. So I'll start with you guys first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, should I start? No, let's not start with how we prevent it. Now, monkeypox yes. is a disease, yes. a dreaded disease yep. that we get from animals. Yes. And it's been said that it's caused by bushmeat. So it's usually okay. people who eat bushmeat. Now, this bushmeat... Mm -hmm of a meat mm -hmm. that we eat all the time mm -hmm. seems to be the cost of several things. So I know, I know that Ebola, there was also you know, stories mm -hmm. about it as well coming mm -hmm. from bushmeat. Mm -hmm. Do you think we should cut bushmeat entirely out of our diets? Mm -hmm. No, seriously, because it seems to be causing more harm than good. And based on this change of lifestyle that we're talking about, a preventive health care, mm -hmm. should we <laughs> take it out? Really? Um, uh, okay, the, uh, the, the answer is that, is that the, whether we cut out bushmeat really will be a decision for probably the public health officials to decide. But what we can say from my own point of view is that, um, obviously, we, as you said, um, monkeypox is a virus uh, similar to smallpox, uh, which is transmitted from animals that are infected, uh, so people who come in contact with the fluids or the blood. So let's start with that. So first of all, anyone who deals with animals should really have good hygiene. Uh, if there's any suspect, suspicion that an animal has been sick or is dead, then... And then there's also um, a risk uh, that if someone eats meat that is not properly cooked, then there's also a risk of transmission. And, un and unfo unfortunately, if an adult, if a human being has caught the disease, uh, there is a risk of transmission from one human to the other, which is probably the scary part. So... Um, I'm not sure about eliminating bushmeat. <laughs> I'm not sure whether because how do you actually implement it? Well, I don't it? eat it, so I know, I, I, maybe that's why I I'm sure you But I think the thing should. that we can do for sure is essentially we have to come back to that awareness. And awareness, and first of all, hygiene has to be, in especially at this kind of time, has to be, you know, you know optimal. Uh, washing our hands properly with soap and water. Uh, and, um, I mean, obviously, if you're the, I mean, you know, the meat as much as possible has to be well prepared. So you're saying period. the problem is not with the bushmeat, it's actually with the care of the meat. Because I think you had mentioned that a bit earlier. Yeah, so it's, so it's, for, it's the procedure from the animal, from cutting up the animal down to serving the food to a person. So through all the stages of that um, process, or process, there has to be guidelines that people understand that the proper way of handling things. So when you're cutting the meat, are you well protected? If, you if you're cutting up the animal, are you well protected? Are you gloved? Uh, we know that's not going to happen. We know it's not going to happen, but I mean, yeah, you glove. if you're not, then are you taking extra precaution to make sure that the fluids don't get on you? And once you've done, once you've caught up the animal, have you washed your hands properly? Uh, I mean, those are simple things you can do. You don't, you don't, you're not going to go out of your way to go and buy expensive equipment or expensive machinery <laughs> that's going to cut the meat for you. There's those simple things you can do. Just wash your hands, then, you know, when you're cooking the food, make sure it's properly cooked. It's not, it's not like it's halfway cooked because you're in a hurry. Okay, you're so you're for, are, you for, are you for or against bushmeat? I mean, being I, eradicated. <laughs> no, like, maybe yeah, maybe no we should just really do a tour. <laughs> <laughs> because what's your, what's, your, what's your take on this? Um, I'm never for banning things that you can't enforce. Okay. Because how are you going to enforce that? Um, but it's more about, like the doctors have said, um, enforcing safe practices in... Um, and just across, across the board, you know, with food, I mean, that goes all the way from meat to vegetables to fish, um, and just as much as possible, um, people understanding the importance of um, keeping to um, health and safety standards. I like how graceful you are about this. <laughs> this is banned bushmeat already, <laughs> seriously. But now, um, you know, it's still, still on uh, monkey pox. Mm -hmm. It's in Lagos. Okay. It's in six other states. It's in seven states now. Mm -hmm. What can and, and I know that the Center for Disease Control is mm -hmm. really yes. on it yes. because they are. I mean, I mean, after what we did with Ebola, I yes. trust Nigerian government yes. officials on, on on several several of these. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. So what what can we do as individuals to ensure that no, number one, you know, what are, what are the symptoms okay. of of monkeypox? Okay. Let's start with that. So uh, the symptoms are. 
um, uh, first of all, you have headache, fever, muscle pain, um, what we call lymph node swelling, and then there's the onset of the pox, which sometimes starts um, the rash, or you know, the, what we see starts in the face and then spreads. Uh, typically, it could last like uh, the whole thing could be like seven to, uh, to fourteen days, uh, and then uh, those are the, those are the symptoms. Um, it's some there is uh, I mean some some there is a link with smallpox and it's sort of similar to smallpox but I think it doesn't have the lymph nodes uh, smallpox doesn't have lymph node involvement but um, it, there isn't actually any treatment per se uh, but this is why there is more emphasis on preventing it happening or managing it um, as you rightfully mentioned the Cent Nigerian Center for Disease Control which is run by Dr Chikwe Hekwazu who um, is who went to my med school and happens to um, um, I mean, he's doing a very, very good job, and we've um, tried to collaborate with him on some projects, but I mean, he's really doing a good job. So what they do is that they try to um, map the... So essentially, if there's an outbreak in Lagos, they try to control the, the outbreak. So if, if you can get... If somebody reports that this has happened, and everyone can say, OK, now that you think you have the symptom, just stay away, and then it's what you call contact tracing. You try and see who's coming in contact with you, follow those ones up, you keep the disease going, and that is a very good job. And I'm confident that um, um, with, with, with the work they're doing, that they should be able to definitely, definitely not have... Um, I don't think we have any reported deaths. I don't think there's any reported no, deaths no, in the media. No, no, not as of so, the last time we So that is them. what they're doing. So awareness is the thing. You know, not just saying, oh, well, just, I just, you know, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, just get on with it. No, it doesn't work like that anymore. So, yeah, the NCDC doing a very good job. We have to be aware. And just like, you know, Dr. Bokwe said, you know, you just have to be conscious of those those height. So how do we prevent it? So how do you ensure that, okay, you know, it, it doesn't... The, the truth about it is that I don't want to, you know, you don't want to create stigmas, but yes, if, exactly. if, if somebody is, if somebody you feel somebody is having those symptoms, fever, definitely if you see the pox, you have to, unfortunately, you have to keep your, you have to, because it can be spread by respiratory, it can be spread by contact with the person, and even the, sometimes the, con the things that, like the beddings that they've used, so you just have to isolate those people. If somebody has it, they have to be isolated for the whole period of the illness so that they don't spread it. And that is what, you know, that's what, you know, some other, sense, some other um, countries may, what you do, like quarantine, or they call it called. So you keep them away from other people, you keep it from spreading, you know, and you don't, if, you, if anyone suspects symptoms there, yeah, you, you, um, okay. you, you. Okay, that's fine. Um, do you want to add anything to that as well? No, he's pretty much touched on everything that we need to do. It's just basically, if you suspect someone has a small, um, has a monkeypox, you basically, you know, isolate the person and, and um, you know, manage, manage, and I think management of the patient. So, so you have managing the symptoms, managing the headaches, um, managing the rashes, managing the fever that, that might accompany the disease as well. But, you know, there's really not much we can do. Key thing, as he's always said, is awareness. Uh, that's the main thing is to prevent. No, we don't have to wait to that stage where we actually doing a fire fire hose approach of trying to kill everything out. It's creating awareness is very key. Very it's, key. The, it's, the most, it's the most effective way of um, dousing any outbreaks that we have. Okay. Um, and and uh, back to Bukala. Now, we have, um, in terms of, because we talked about preventive health care um, earlier with, with them for a while, um, and then I had spoken with you earlier in terms of, uh, you know, sickle cell and your experiences as well, um, awareness, education, uh, and just several other elements um, around uh, the condition which you uh, do very well with with with, found, with your foundation uh, as well. Would you say, um, based on the work you do in your own foundation, in terms of prevention, uh, essentially ensuring that you know once you you're both, or maybe you should just even tell me the work that you do. Yeah. So because sickle cell is a genetic disorder, it's passed down by inheriting a gene from each parent, and which is why. Um, um, the focus of our work in SCAF has been the Know Your Genotype campaign, which is trying to get as many people as possible um, aware of their genotype and understanding how um, the risks with when you're a carrier, the risks with having a child that has sickle cell. But if you're asking about the awareness levels, um, it really just depends on where you are. So in our work in, say, the urban centers like Lagos and Abuja, you generally find that people might not know their genotype, but they know um, what a gen genotype is, they know what sickle cell is, they have a vague idea of how mm -hmm. it's passed down. The main problem is actually in a lot of the semi-urban or the rural areas where a lot of people, um, you know, oftentimes they, when they have a child, they're just like, the child's always sick, I don't know what's wrong with mm -hmm. him. And late diagnosis is actually the biggest killer of um, children living with sickle cell. So the, the biggest um, mortality for children 
um, living with sickle cells between um, when they're born and five years old. And that's often because we don't do what we, what's known as newborn screening, which is testing all children that are born for certain types of disorders. Um, so a lot of our work is now trying to focus on how can we get that awareness um, to rural areas using local languages, using um, traditional birth centers and things like that to be able to identify the sim symptoms of children that have sickle cell. Now, one of the things I realized, and, and please, I, I stand to be corrected, is I realized that there's a lot of work being done where, whether it's with health or several other sectors, and, and this is based on what you have said, is there's several people who have done several things that we want to do. Um, so whether it's, you know, research to find out how to get into, penetrate into these communities, how the kind of languages they understand, why do you think that everyone just always wants to do their own? Because, for example, with what you have, I think this, isn't there like a template or something that we have access to that we can just use and ensure that the word is spread around, the word to prevent um, sickle cell, the word to prevent... Um, Hell, I can see you, you're always, is it that you're always smiling? So what I just said that just got you to go, go see you. <laughs> no, because everyone, I, no, it's, it's really, like, it's something that really concerns me. It's all, I don't know whether it's that the people who have it hide it. So everyone, it's almost like we're all kind of pretty much trying to reinvent the wheel, looking for new ways to do it. How do I do it? But you're like, but this person did it five years ago. They're still mm. doing it. Why can't we take a leaf from them or use what they have and collaborate and then spread it do you think that that's something um, that we should i mean we definitely in in our line of work we definitely do a lot of collaborations because um sickle cell is um a disease that has ramifications um across all the all parts of the body so you know it's not something you can do in an isolated sort of way so mm -hmm. you would need to see a hematologist for example if you have sickle cell but then at the same time you, you might need to see an ophthalmologist kidney specialist pediatrician and and so we do work with um, a number of people and then we also work with a number of organizations but the truth is that in Nigeria, because of lack of education, there's only a limit to what you can do. Generally, when people are, war like, you know, what he was saying, if you live in more advanced countries, for example, um, your chances of knowing about diseases and how to take care of yourself and preventing certain things are, gr are higher. But, you know, a lot of the, of the burden comes when people have very little access to information or education um, or opportunities. And so that's the reason why it seems like we're we're constantly working but not maybe seeing the sort of mm -hmm. big leaps mm -hmm. in milestones mm -hmm. that we're looking for yes so it all comes down to you know economics poverty um lack of education um and if we don't solve these things you know so it's almost like you're doing patchwork do you sort of agree yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very really sad isn't it yeah. there's a mentality of um it's, it can't happen to me uh, even though it happened to him, it happened to me. But where in other cultures or in other areas, people have learned and, okay, it happened to that guy, I'm not going to let it happen to me. And unfortunately, that's going to keep happening. And we find that. But um, it's changing, but it's changing really slowly, really slowly. But Yeah, because sometimes, because while I understand and I'm really, really happy with your stories where everyone's taking the bull by its horn and not waiting for government, but the reality is at the end of the day, the government still has that real big umbrella role to play. Because most especially when it comes to spreading it and going in, I know that you have said in some cases they're kind of limited, in some cases maybe they can't do so much. But I, I've always thought that because reality is their policies influence what we do. So many other things that they actually bring in um, influences it. Otherwise, it's almost like um, what's a drop of a drop of idea in like in a, in a, in a mighty ocean. The truth is, I, you know, and I used to be of your opinion until I started doing the work that I was doing, you can have the best policies in the world, but if, if you don't have the sort of money or the manpower or the technical know-how to implement it, it's not going to do anything. So, and, and really, that's where the government lacks capacity, and this is where um, players like us come in. Because, you know, say, for example, with... Um, with blood health, for example, you know, the, the legislations are there, you know, 100% voluntary blood donation. There's a roadmap on how we want to get to 100% voluntary bl blood donation within the next, say, 10 years. It's all there on paper, perfectly printed, um, you know, but how can you achieve that? You can only achieve that if you have money, if you have the resources, human resources, um, if you have sort of the technical resources, and the government just simply does not have that. So how are we going to make the government have it? <laughs> no, no, like, no, I know, I know, I know this is not exactly, because why I, again, love this panel is this is not a talk shop. Mm -hmm. You are people doing mm -hmm. the little that you can. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, at the end of the day, fine, you have the technical know-how, they kind of have a bit of money. Yeah. So how can, how can we all come together to ensure that every area that you're working on in the health sector 
achieve, maybe not get to 100% level yet, because you know that may be a bit too much, but at least makes progress that we can all see and feel. Mm. Mm. And the government will have to support our, our, our drives for mm. education and awareness, but I think a lot of things these days, we're trying to say your health is in your hands. I think that's a popular one. Mm. And it's going to have to come from the individuals. The government has the role to play, like Bukia said, and they have the legislation and they have it all there. But ultimately, you have to want to do it. You have to want to accept it. So education is the key thing. Awareness, you know. Um, people, who do people want to listen to? If you want to listen to the pastor or the imam or the, the chief, you know, that's the person that you need to be listening to. You need to destroy these myths that it's not a bad thing, you know, to do this thing. You know, that, you know, those are the people you need to listen to. And even in developed, um, um, developed um, health systems, it's the same thing in the world. Uh, you don't go to a, if you if there's a community that has more of a certain uh, culture, you want to pass something that you have to approach the people who will take it to them, otherwise it's a waste of time. So even yeah, so I mean, that. the gatekeeper is very essential yeah. and, okay, yeah, fair they, they, they got to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, like Bukela has already uh, highlighted, is that we don't actually do not have capacity. We really, we're really, in terms of the healthcare system in Nigeria, we're really quite short staff. Consider that currently there are 9,000 doctors available to about 180 million people. Hmm. What? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's another... <laughs> that for another day. Mm. Oh, but let's just quickly take your uh, social media handle quickly. So your, your website, again, for those who want to donate blood or find out more information is... Um, HaimaHealth.org.ng and all our social media is Haima underscore health. Okay. And for Dennis... It's a DAW Ash. clinic on all our social media handles. And your website is www.dennisashley.com. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of the morning show today. Thanks once again to my wonderful guests. And thank you, my viewers, for joining me. I'm Lava Daniel. And um, from my entire team and I here in Lagos, all that's left for me to say is enjoy the rest of your morning and, of course, the rest of your day. Goodbye.